Like Smith, Mill divided commodities into three groups based on their reproducibility. In some cases, there was an absolute limitation of the supply, owing to the fact that it was physically impossible to increase the quantity beyond certain narrow limits. As examples, he listed the same kinds of commodities as Smith, works of art and produce grown on specific rare types of soil. Other commodities could be multiplied without limit, giving the willingness to incur a certain amount of labor and expense to obtain them. Finally, some commodities could be multiplied indefinitely with su sufficient labor and expenditure, but not by a fixed amount of labor and expenditure. Greater levels of output require greater units of cost of production. Here he referred mainly to agricultural produce. Mill was somewhat more explicit than Ricardo in dealing with the time element in determining the degree of elasticity. The time period involved in gravitational price toward cost depended on the length of time required to adjust production to changes in demand or to dispose of surplus produce. Again, though there are few commodities which are at all times and forever unsusceptible of increase of supply, any, any commodity, whatever may be temporarily so, agri agricultural produce, for example, cannot be increased in quantity before the next harvest. In the case of most commodities, it requires a certain time to increase their quantity, and if the demand increases, then until a corresponding supply can be brought forward, that is, until the supply can accommodate itself to the demand, the value will also rise as to accommodate the demand to the supply. Like Ricardo, Mill believed that price was governed by the cost of production for those producers most unfavorably circumstanced. Those in a more advantageous situation would receive a producer's surplus equivalent to the, their cost's savings. And like Ricardo, he applied the principle not only to economic rent on land, but to quasi-rents -rent, on manufactured goods. 2. If the portion of products, pro, produce raised in the most unfavorable circumstances obtained a value proportional to its cost of production, all the portions raised in more favorable circumstances, selling as they must do at the same value, obtain a value more than pr proportioned to their cost of production. The owners of those pr portions of the produce obtain a value which yields them more than ordinary profit. If this advantage depends upon any special exception, such as being free from a tax or upon a any personal advantages, physical or mental, or any per peculiar process only known to themselves, or upon the possession of a greater capital than other people, or upon various other things which might be enumerated, they return it to themselves as an extra gain over and above the general profits of capital of the nature in some sort of a monopoly profit. Cases of extra profit analogous to rent are more frequent in transitions of industry or transactions of industry than is sometimes supposed. Take the case, for example, of a patent or exclusive privilege for the use of a process by which cost of production is lessened. If the value of the product continues to persist the, in the old process, the patent Patentee will make an extra profit equal to the advantage which his process possesses over theirs. Marx and Engels were in complete agreement with the classical political economists on the role of competition in regulating the law of value. Engels, in his preface to Marx's Poverty of Philosophy, ridiculed the utopian socialist notion of making labor the basis of a medium of exchange. The market forces of supply and demand were needed to inform the producer of the social demand for this, his product and to establish the normal amount of social labor necessary for the production of a given commodity. So the deviation of price from value at any given time was not a violation of the law of value, but its driving mechanism. In present day capitalist society, each individual capitalist produces off his own bat whatnot. Uh, how and as much as he likes. The social demand, however, remains a, an unknown magnitude to him, both in regard to quality and kind of 
objects required and in regard to quantity. Nevertheless, demand is finally satisfied in way or another, good or bad, and taken as a whole, production is ultimately geared towards the object required. How is this even evening out of the contradiction affected? By competition. And how does the competition bring about this solution? Simply by depreciating below their labor value those commodities which, by their kind or amount, are useless for immediate social requirements, and by making the producers feel that they have produced either absolutely useless articles or ostensibly useful articles and unusable super, super, superfluous quantity. Continual deviations of the price of prices of commodities from their values are the necessary conditions in and the through which the value of the commodity is, uh, as such can come into existence. Uh, only through the fluctuations of competition and consequently of commodity prices does the law of value commodity production assert itself and the determination of value of the commodity by the socially necessary labor time become a reality. To desire in a society of producers who exchange their commodities to establish the determination of value by labor time by forbidding competition to establish this determination of value through pressure on prices in the only way it can be established is therefore merely to prove that one has adopted the usual utopian disdain of economic laws. Only through the undervaluation of overvaluation of products is it forcibly brought home to in the individual commodity producers what society requires or does not require and in what amounts. Marx made very much the same argument in the main body of the poverty of philosophy. It was market price that signaled the producer how much to produce and thus regulated price according to the law of value. It is not the sale of a given product at the price of its cost of production which cons constitutes the proportional relation of supply and demand or the proportional quota of this product relatively to to the sum total of production. If it is the variations in demand and supply that show the producer what amount of a given commodity he must produce in order to receive at least the cost of production in exchange. And as these variations are continually occurring, there is also a continual movement of withdrawal and application of capital in the different branches of industry. Competition implements the law according to which the relative value of a product is determined by labor time needed to produce it. Marx and Engels' remarks in these passages probably came closer to, than anyone else to meeting Bohm Barwerk's demand for a mechanism of the law of value. See chapter 2 below. In Grun Deris, Marx described the functioning of the law of value through the movement price in somewhat more dialectical language. The value of commodities determined by labor time is only their average value. The market value of commodities is always different from this average value and always stands either below or above it. The market value equates itself to the real value by means of its continual fluctuations, not by an equation with real value as something third thing, but precisely through continued inequality to itself. Price, therefore, differs from value, not only as the nominal differs from the real, not only by its denomination in gold and silver, but also in that the latter appears as the law of the movements to which the former is subject, but they are always distinct and never con coincide, or only quite fortuitously and exceptionally the price of commodities always stands above and below their value and the value of commodities itself exists only in the ups and downs of commodity prices. Demand and supply continually determine the price of commodities. They never coincide or do they so only accidentally but 
the cost prediction determine for their part the fluctuation of demand and supply. And such deviations from value include quasi rents to those who first introduced more effort mo me efficient methods of production. It was only through the market incentive presented by such quasi rents and through the resulting competition that improved methods were universally adopted and came to define the standard form of production. A capitalist working with improved but not as yet generally adopted methods of production sells below the market price but above his individual price of production. His rate of profit rises until competition levels it out. Finally, to bring up the mud pie straw man from another or for another beating, Marx made socially necessary labor the regulator of value. The labor theory of value applied only to commodities which were objects of human need. Labor expended in producing goods not demanded or excess labor wasted in methods of production less efficient than the norm was a dead loss. It was the function of the market price in denying payment for such unnecessary labor that brought the producer in accord with the wishes of society.